Hello there, I greet you in the name of Jesus. Uh, this is my first time of uh, filming like this at home because of the lock-in that's in London right now. So please give me the benefit of the doubt, but I want to speak to you some things rather really quickly about what's going on in the world and our attitude. And I want to talk about really the revelation of what it, what does it really look like to have Christ in you, the hope of glory? I mean, we can say those things, but Christ in us. And I, I want to read some familiar verse from 2 Samuel 6. We all know the story of Uzzah, but I want you to just read it again. I want to start from verse 3. 2 Samuel 6, verse 3, this is the Amplified Bible. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahil, sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which is on the hill, with the ark of God. And Ahil went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel pray, played before the Lord with all their might, with songs, lyres, harps, tambourines, castanets, cymbals. And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God, took hold of it, for the oxen had stumbled and shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for touching the ark, and he died there by the ark of God. And of course, they really upset David. But this is the issue. Why did he die? Was it because God was mad, or angry? No. It's because of the principle of the power of the presence of God. From heaven's vantage point, nothing impure, nothing unclean, well, for that matter, nothing even negative can come nigh heaven, but nothing impure or unclean can come nigh and touch the housing of the presence of God and live. And as it just died, because he came in contact with that which was holy. I love the root word of the word holy. The root word of holy is different. This is why throughout all eternity, the four and 20 elders and everybody are going to be going holy, 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 because they're actually saying different, different. They're going to, for all eternity, we're going to see another facet of this incredible diamond that is God, the beauty of him, and just something more beautiful. This is even more wonderful, more beautiful. But this is the issue. Scripture tells us in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 3, 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 Corinthians 6, 2 Corinthians 6, that we are the temple of God, right? And again, most of us should have heard this teaching much. I'll just read 2 Corinthians 6, 16. What agreement can there be between a temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Even as God said, I will dwell in and with and among them and will walk in and with and among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Again, having biblical knowledge is very different from having scriptural revelation. It, what I'm trying to get at right now is just as Uzzah touched that and died. Today, God, we are today the ark of the covenant. We house God. God's covenant is to be engrafted upon the fleshly tablets of our heart, not just grasped with our mind, carved into our very being, into our spirit man, carved into who we really are. And of course, the basics of what I'm trying to get at is I want you to see things through God's economy. In God's mind, it makes no difference if it's, a, if it's a virus, if it's, I don't care what it is, anything impure, anything demonic, such as this virus, nothing should come nigh us and be able to live because of our righteousness. No, but of course, because of his righteousness that has been deposited into our spirit by the blood of Jesus Christ and our belief in him. We are right with God only by virtue of Christ and his love for us. But this is the point. We are the ark today. In heaven's economy, heaven doesn't see why anything evil can touch us. Remember when Jesus said, the evil one comes when he finds nothing in me to attach himself to. The thing that Satan finds to attach himself to is unbelief is lack of knowledge, is scripture that hasn't been taken to the point of revelation. 
And this is why you have to work with the Word and you have to be so diligent to renew your mind, to be transformed in the way you think. So that no, so that you just, you know, I love the phrase where it says, Wade, I was persuaded beyond doubt. I love that. Beyond we're we're so aware of God truth that we get way beyond doubt. I mean, where we get so far beyond doubt, doubts left in the weeds so far back. Jesus said, This is the work that you believe. Not that you reason, that you figure out, but that you believe. And one of the things he desperately wants to believe is that we are his son. This is why it says, I will be their God. They will be my child. He said, I'm going to come and abide in you. I'm going to live in you. I mean, he's Jesus Christ in us is the hope of God being glorified in the earth. Heaven's hope is that we'll be so in tune with Christ, so aligned to his ways and his truth that nothing will have any place to attach itself into us simply because we believe the promise. I believe the promise giver. And I believe the promise that the promise giver has given. That stuff shall not come nigh me. Now, I'm grateful that we're all quoting Psalm 91 right now because we need to. But remember, it says all this will happen because we have set our love upon him. Really, we've set our love. In other words, all of our direction, our attention has been placed on the living God because he has shown himself to us through his love, through his word, through spending time talking with him in prayer, spending time communing with God, talking with him, sitting with the book open, sitting with the book or reading these scriptures out loud to yourself and saying, Lord God, you're so good. You've actually done, you've actually blessed me with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. I mean, you know, these, this, the mind can't figure out all of this stuff, but the heart can receive them by faith. If we will simply make that decision, I, I believe, I don't understand. My reason isn't working here. But something in me says, I believe this. This is true. And this is what he's waiting for. And this is why we have no reason to fear this stuff that's out there. Think about if Jesus Christ would have been afraid to lay hands on a leper. Like right now, understandably, we need to take precautions. People are freaking out. Everybody, you know, don't, you know, this social distancing and all this stuff. Thank God Jesus Christ did not socially distance himself from the lepers or from the sick. He went to them. Why? Because he knew who he was. He knew that the strength and the authority that he carried was far beyond earthly sickness and disease. He knew that there was no dev devils freaked out when he even got near because they sensed somebody that had the presence of God, that was God in the flesh. And, I, you know, you love it. Even remember the story in the book of Acts 7, Sons of Siva. They said, we, uh, they tried to cast some devils out. And they said, we cast you, we adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preaches, come out of the man of the devils. And isn't it amazing what the devil said? This time they spoke the truth. They said, Jesus we know and Paul we know, but who are you? And they jumped on, ripped their clothes off, ran them off naked. Demons knew Paul. Do they know you? Do they actually know that Christ lives so big in you that they're afraid they don't want anything to do with you. But this is what we're supposed to carry. Christ in us. Christ in us. Do we believe this? God is in me. God has placed his spirit in me. I am a son of God. He said, you will be my children. I will be your God. I, do we believe that. I'm the son of God. It is true. No weapon formed against me is going to ultimately prosper because of his love, not because I'm so strong, not because I'm a super spiritual giant. No, it's because he has gone beyond my transgressions, beyond my shortcomings, beyond all the places that I fall and I fail. And he's loved me way past my issues. <laughs> he's an amazing God, he's an amazing, loving, loving God. He's loved me beyond that. And I know it's still difficult, even for me sometimes, I think about that. How can you love me knowing every stupid thing about me that you do? But he does because it says he, I love it. Living Bible says, God loved you like this because it was his, he wanted to. It just flat says because he wanted to. It was his choice. He said, I'm going to love you no matter what. Because of you believe in Jesus, that's enough for me. 
I'm going to love you. I'm going to keep you. I'm going to protect you. So you are the Ark of the Covenant. And I love in Philippians 2, 5, where it says, have this same mind, which was in Christ Jesus, have the same attitude. Think about that. We can have the same attitude that Jesus did. He wasn't afraid of a leper because he knew the leprosy was afraid of him. We all know the story of John G. Lake. Those of us who've read over the years, you know how the bubonic plague was so treacherous, killing thousands upon thousands of people. And you can read it all for yourself to read the exact things, about two pages that tells of it all in his book, on the books about him. But, you know, the plague got in his hand. And like he said, he said, I'm not afraid of the plague. The plague's afraid of me. And that stuff, that essence of that stuff, I don't I think it was the spittle of somebody or something out of the plague. Anyhow, it got on his hand. They put it on a microscope slide and every aspect of it had died, just died because it came in contact with John G. Lake's skin. Well, God's no respecter of persons, is he? God's no respecter of churches. He will not do for one what he will not do for other when similar circumstances are there or established. In other words, it comes down to faith. This is the victory that overcomes the world. And we, I know we know 1 John 5, 4, but this is the victory that overcomes the world, even your faith, what you believe. But Ephesians 6, you know, when this stuff comes, is have you lifted your shield up? You have to answer that for yourself. Is your shield lifted up? What does it say? Lift up the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench every fiery dart of the wicked one. This entire thing, this pandemic, is all one big satanic issue. Do you understand why it's so sad when you think about how many of the body of Christ are responding in fear? Satan? Fear is one of Satan's most used strategies. Of course it is, because fear is the opposite of faith. But remember our basic teaching, both attract. Faith attracts the promises of God. Fear will attract the works of Satan. It's just that simple. But again, think about this, you know, you have to lift that shield up. Faith is what you believe. And of course, you have to talk about the words of your mouth then, because the spirit of faith is that you believe and then you speak, which is what Paul said. Therefore, having the spirit of, therefore, having the spirit of faith, we have believed, therefore, have we, have we spoken. Therefore, have we believed, and therefore, have I spoken. We do know what we believe by what comes out of our mouth when we're under pressure. And that's the whole issue. When the pressure's on, what's inside a human's heart is what comes out. So God help us have the same mind of Christ. He was not fearful of this stuff. He didn't run from it. He ran to it. Number 1648, when the plague was in the midst of Israel, Moses told Aaron, get that censer, put that incense on there and run right out into the middle of the plague. And of course, the incense is always a type that represents prayer. He said, take prayer and run right out in the middle of the plague. And what happened, it says, and the plague was state. It stopped dead the moment prayer that had faith in God's promises went out into the middle of the plague. The plague died. <sighs> We're the children of God. We're the children of God. The effectual, righteous, fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman avails much. There's much power available, dynamic in its working. If we ask anything according to the will of God, we know that he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, we know that we have the petitions that we desire. Now, many of you can quote that, but you know what? It's I have to honestly say, I think it takes a few years before you say that, and it comes right out of your spirit, man doesn't come out of your head. It doesn't, it's not something that you've memorized. It's something that you know like you know your name. Nobody can tell me my name isn't Rod. Nobody can tell me my name is George. My name is Rod. Nobody can intimidate me out of the knowledge of my name. I know who I am. But see, that's how Satan functions. He's Satan, he, he functions through intimidation. He screams, he yells, he makes noise, and he says, you're not this, you're not this, you're not loved, you're not loved of God, you're going to fail, you're going to never succeed, you're going to die, you're going to catch this stuff. That's his job. He's the deceiver, he's the father of lies. But the truth, remember the truth is more powerful than facts. 
Facts change. Truth never changes. Truth is where the power is. When you keep the truth in your heart and you keep that truth in your well, listen, if the truth is in your heart, the truth will be in your mouth. I mean, that's just the way it is. So this is why we've got to ask ourselves some questions. Are we actually in faith? In Corinthians, it says, examine yourself whether you be in the faith. First John says that perfect love casts out fear. We all know that too in 1 John 5, 18. And that, I love it in the Amplified, it says dread doesn't even exist. Dread won't even exist. So when there's an aspect of fear, we have to be honest with ourselves and say, you know what, to a degree, the problem here is uh, I'm still not absolutely convinced of the depth of God's love for me because I, uh, I'm still worrying. Worry is a sin to a Christian. I'm fearful. But see what fear says, fear is actually a statement of distrust in God's love. Did you hear me? Any form of fear, well, first of all, it's demonic, but any form of fear is a declaration of either I have a lack of knowledge of what God has done in Christ, or I've simply don't believe. I believe the voice of what the virus is saying and what the media is saying. That voice is speaking louder to me than God's voice. And that's not supposed to be the case. That's why, like I keep telling me, there's no shortcuts. You need to be in the book every day. You need your mind metamorphosized. You need your mind transformed. You it's so beautiful when you get to the place that you think God's thoughts, that when the bad thoughts come, when they, they do, you learn, you just cast the suckers down. I'm not taking that thought. That's, that's why Jesus said, take no anxious thought. See, the only he said, take no anxious thought, saying, what should we eat? What should we think about this. The way you take a thought, the way a thought has life is when you say it. Take no thought, saying. Take no thought, saying. Don't say the thought. If you will not say the thought, the thought will die unborn. But what you learn to do is to take the thoughts of God and then speak those, and then the thoughts of the hell will shut up because the voice of God will always be louder if you let it. Hallelujah. So again, this is why we have to catch this. Fear is actually anti-Christ. And again, it means it's anti-everything that Christ came to do. So what I'm trying to tell you this morning is I want you to understand you are the Ark of the Covenant. You carry God's promises. You are God's son or daughter. He has, he, you know, I mean, Hebrews 13, that verse we love to quote, Hebrews 13, 6, I will not, I will not, I will not in any way ever leave you nor forsake you. But the next verse says, so that that's all true, so that we can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do. The Lord is my helper. Please know the Lord's your helper. Please know he's more desirous of showing himself alive in you than you are wanting him to. But he works according to, as it were, spirit law. We have to move toward him in faith. People could not enter in to rest because of unbelief. We know, and again in Hebrews it says, even though the promise is given, the promise is given unto them as well as unto us, but the promise given did not prosper them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. You have to mix faith with the promises for them to manifest in your life. But right now we need to rise up. And this word God kept speaking to me. Uh, well, a couple of things that have been real strong. He said, if we don't rise up now, when? And I kept hearing this phrase, if not now, when? If not now, when? This this plague, this virus, it's just the first of many. Jesus said in Luke 21, there's going to be plagues and epidemics. Trust me, this is a prelude. If we don't stand up now, when are you going to stand up? Why not now? You need to stretch this spirit muscle of yours. You know, the Bible says that bodily exercise profiteth a little, but godliness is profitable unto all things. You need to exercise your faith muscle. So you get strong enough that, again, you simply don't fear. It'll not come nigh me. That stuff comes nigh me, it's going to die. In fact, I am I am the antidote. I, you know, the, the truth of God is the great antidote. It's the, it's, the, it's the aggressive vaccine. When you carry the revelation of truth, that's what shuts the devil up in a moment, is your revelation of the truth. The great virus is fear. The great virus isn't... Corona, the great virus is fear, but we have the great truth. 
That's why we can say the greater one lives in me. The one inside of me is greater than the virus. It's bigger. It's bigger. I win. Hallelujah. I will not fear. I choose to not fear is a choice. You make the choice, and, and, but it comes because you believe the love. I believe, I love in 1 John, it says, believe the love that God has for you. You have to believe that he loves you that much. And I know that's so difficult because we are so acutely aware of where we fall short. And I understand that. I know the shortcomings that are still in my life. But I, this is why, but when you, you cannot stay in the book, I mean, when you read Romans, I'd read Romans 5 billion times. I'm telling you, the whole book of Romans, read it as one letter. Read it out loud to yourself over and over again in the Amplified Bible. He loves us. He's deposited rights. We're in harmony with God because of Jesus, not because of our behavior. Remember, that's why it says, it says, it says in fact, Scripture says, now are you holy. And now you're holy. And, you know, I love that because the root word of holy means different. It means we're different. See, we're different than the world. We're not supposed to fit in out there. We're different. You're the different ones. You're the ones God loves. You're the ones God's sanctified. He sets you apart. The principle of Goshen, Exodus 8, Exodus 9, 10, 11, and 12. I'm setting a division between you and Egypt. What comes on Egypt will not come on you. I'm making a declaration that they might know that I am the living God and all of their gods are false gods. That was the whole principle. And the whole issue of Goshen, Goshen is a type and a symbol of today's kingdom of God and the kingdom dwells within us. You need to see yourself like this. I have the kingdom of God on the inside of me. This stuff can't come nigh me and live. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in this world. Hallelujah. Well, this is what God sees, and I just want us to see it as well. I'm going to cut it short and leave it right here. But please know, God being for you is more than enough than anything that can come against you. God's grace is upon you. God's love is for you. He knows everything silly about you, but he no longer looks at us through our issues, our sins, our transgressions. He looks at us as clothed with Jesus, his son. His right standing has been imputed to you and I. Hallelujah. It's not based upon my behavior anymore. My salvation is based upon Christ's behavior and my belief in it. Amen. Now, Father, I speak life and blessing to my people and to whosoever may watch this. And I pray that truly the spirit of faith rises up so mightily, so powerfully in them that they literally have a personal awakening to who they are in you, that they are strong in you and in the power of your might, that there is no foe that can come against them and stand successfully, that they are sons, they are daughters of the Most High God, and that because God is for you, Nothing can stand against you. So, Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. This demonic virus dies and dies now in Jesus' name across this earth. Thank you that the people of God rise up and stand in the grace wherein you have placed them, that they walk before you with their whole hearts. And we thank you, Holy Ghost, for the manifestation of your power and your grace upon each and every one of us. And again, we will not fear. We are the antidote. We are the solution. We are the answer. We will abide by the laws of the land. But Father, we will not bow down to any satanic idol called coronavirus. No, no, no. Greater is the one in me than that stuff that's in the world. So we give you praise and I thank you. I speak strength, life, blessing, and wholeness to everybody who hears this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Listen, God bless you richly. We love you. We're praying for you. Walk in faith. No doubt. Just say it. No fear here. Amen. No fear here. We love you. Julie and I love you. God bless. Hello, my name is Julie Anderson and I'm here to receive the church offering this morning and we're doing things differently okay so do what you can do 
give with a cheerful heart. Proverbs 16 2 says, All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirits, the thoughts, and the intents of the heart. So when you give, give in obedience. Obedience leads us to maturity. And, um, you know, I've always taught you how to develop your spiritual life and how to develop your perspective of eternity. And God is changing things. God is rearranging things. See God in all of this transition. Help yourself by staying in obedience and being right with God. Um, I just want to encourage you as you give. Give from your heart. Put your heart in your giving. Um, Worship God in spirit and truth. I'm just reading my notes here. You're a spirit being. <laughs> and, and being a spirit being, you, you must look at life differently. You know, even if, even if you don't want to look at life, that you're making spiritual progress. So I bless you today as you give. We're giving differently. You can give online, we're talking online, we're praying online, we're having meetings online. We're doing things online. Okay, so we're learning how to change. There it goes again. Okay, I'm getting so many, I guess only I can hear those, you, you're not hearing them. But I just bless, and I th I, I'm looking up out of this place. This is where I often pray, I'm in my kitchen. Oh. Sorry, bang the glass table, making a lot of noise. Anyway, God bless you and know that it's good to give into the kingdom with a right heart, with God's seed. He loves, a, he loves a cheerful giver. He loves you because he is love and he doesn't know any different. So CCF, be yourself. Do what God's called you to do. Amen, amen.